I thought I would take uh, just a minute to uh, talk about our company and our history because this, the topic is the uh, innovation deficit that is uh, in Canada. We've heard a lot about the private sector hasn't contributed and our company is actually a case study of a company that has and so I just thought I'd spend a couple of minutes talking about that and then touch on some of the issues uh, and challenges that we face uh, and also a little bit about some thoughts for uh, solutions to create companies like ours and to address the innovation challenges we have in healthcare. So here's a couple of pictures here. We got started in December 1913 in a stable on Barton Avenue, not far from here, by Dr. John Fitzgerald, who uh, wanted to uh, treat diphtheria. And so he used his wife's dowry. He got $500 from the University of Toronto, so we we're probably the first biotech startup from a university and he bled four horses in that, uh, in that stable on the left. Uh, a couple of years later, the, uh, the company moved and became Connaught Medical Laboratories. Uh, there was a farm at Dufferin and Steels, where we still exist. Colonel Goodrum of distillery fame donated that farm uh, that was named after the Duke of Connaught. And uh, that building actually still exists to this day as renovated as a meeting room. So we got our start. Uh, there in uh, uh, 50 acres of land that we have up in uh, Dufferin Steels and still there to this day. So over the years there were all sorts of contributions that Connaught Medical Laboratories made and it was part of the uh, University of Toronto. Um, the, clearly with the diphtheria and tetanus antitoxins, diphtheria was a major disease that was affecting uh, cities, particularly Hamilton and Toronto, or one of the hardest hit cities uh, in the world. And so there were efforts made there. Then the World War I broke out and there were te tetanus antitoxins developed. Uh, when Banting and Best discovered insulin, it was commercialized by Connaught in the first place. Uh, when Jonas Salk developed the polio vaccine, there were contributions made by Connaught scientists, both in terms of uh, the media that was being used, which was actually originally developed uh, for cancer treatments way back in the 50s, and a roller bottle technology approach for manufacturing. Uh, smallpox, the only disease that's been officially eradicated from the face of the earth, Connaught contributed towards that, as did some of our other predecessor uh, uh, companies. Uh, and then combination vaccines, and, and lately, um, a uh, blockbuster product, combination vaccine, that takes tetanus, diphtheria, polio, and bacterial meningitis, which, is, which are all discoveries in their own right, um, combined with a pertussis or whooping cough vaccine, uh, uniquely developed here in Canada, researched, developed, manufactured, and that product in combination uh, with those other products has been licensed in 62 countries around the world. Uh, it is a billion dollar blockbuster product that, as I said, researched, developed, manufactured, exported from here. I think it's probably the only billion dollar biotech product in Canada that is in that situation. And uh, so over the years, we now have a 1,100 employees at our Connaught campus in Toronto, uh, 300 in R&D, 700 manufacturing, uh, global R&D mandates, global manufacturing, along with our colleagues on the pharmaceutical side, the Sanofi Aventis Group, uh, 2,000 employees in Canada, and uh, we're the largest innovative healthcare private sector investor overall and the 10th largest uh, private sector healthcare investor in the country. So we've continued to reinvent ourselves through mergers and acquisitions and other things and continue to, uh, to drive going forward. So it's an example, I think, of a, of a Canadian success story, and uh, we've uh, had this long history and we'll continue to try to do that in the future. So that sort of sets the stage for where we're coming from and, and the perspective that I will bring to this. Um, number of challenges facing the Canadian healthcare system, and already in the sessions that I've seen, you've been dealing with these in an in-depth matter, uh, a lot of informed discussion, and, and it's great to see the topics raised because they're being put on the table, they're being discussed, and we're seeing the innovations in all sorts of sector, uh, in all sorts of sectors. So clearly the sustainability due to rising healthcare costs depends on the audience as we speak to. This audience knows this very well and we've seen uh, very, uh, very strong figures on that. Um, it'll only get worse. I mean, people talk a lot about medicines and, um, and the value of medicines. And of course, we all want to live longer, healthier lives. And sometimes we'll hear, and I've heard ministries, ministers of health say, all I need is another medicine that's going to let somebody live longer and have a better quality of life. Well, that's the wrong answer. I mean, the right answer is to try to think about how those things impact our lives, our society, the fact that they drive healthcare costs down in other parts of the system, which we're not very good at measuring. We have very silo-based uh, systems, as you know. And uh, so as we have more 
innovative therapies, whether it's medical devices that were talked about here or other treatments, biological treatments, which are, are very expensive, uh, we're going to be faced with this challenge. The consumers are going to want these products, they're going to want these treatments, and we're going to have to determine how do we deal with that. They want improved access and services, decreased wait times. We had that discussion about uh, waiting in emergency rooms and waiting for doctors. And again, at some point, consumers are dealing with that, but they, they actually, I don't think, realize at this point that the innovative medicines and so on that are starting to be available in other countries and are available in some provinces here but not others, are, that's going to become more and more of an issue for them when they realize they're not getting access to some of these things. And of course the government has severe fiscal restraints and that's factored into this whole equation, particularly as we have a, uh, um, a publicly funded universal health care system, or at least we think we do. Because when we actually look at the data, something about like 70% of the system is publicly funded, about 30% is privately funded, but I think we lose that in some of the debate and some of the discussion that we have. So what are some of the ways we could address sustainability of the healthcare system and improve innovation adoption? Um, having patient access to the most appropriate treatments. We're going to get more specialized medicines that work in some patients and not others. Uh, the, the issue around going to a more centralized procurement system uh, will need to reflect the fact that at the heart of it, we really need to have the patient-doctor conversation. We need medicines that will work for particular patients, and, and that's got to be at the heart of how we get solutions to those kind of things. Uh, the use of electronic health systems, and again, this audience is well versed in this. You've discussed it in a couple of sessions. Uh, things like e-health, as soon as you say it to the general public, they think about a billion dollars of wasteful spending and can hardly move forward from that. At the same time, we're going to have to make progress in that area in order for all of the good, dis good reasons we saw earlier in terms of uh, driving down costs, efficiency, reducing the paperwork. As was said, in what other industry or sector do we have so much paperwork, it's, it's not electronic. Um, where, where would we actually uh, accept that? Uh, E-prescribing, again, linking to e-health records so that we can't have e-prescriptions from the doctor to the pharmacist that can then get filled. We'll have fewer mistakes. We'll have efficiency. These things are going to cost money, and right now there's a public view of it that, that don't want to participate. And we've got a whole issue of communicating with the public and convincing them that this will need to go forward. And it will be expensive. And so getting value for money will be one of the challenges um, as, as we move forward with that. You know, people talk about Ontario as being one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, contract research organizations or clinical research organizations uh, in the world. But because we don't have access through the electronic health records, it really is not functional in terms of things like clinical trials and measuring outcomes and coordinating those sorts of things. Um, one specific example uh, that can help drive innovation and reduce costs is expanding the professional scope of pharmacists. Um, I'm familiar with that in the vaccine world because we're starting to see pharmacists in some provinces have the right to immunize. And uh, that's a very interesting development that's occurring. And one could see the opportunity to expand that in other services, again, to drive innovation uh, efficiency and, uh, and reduce costs. Um, I think at, at the broad level, there's some other opportunities as well um, around policy and other aspects to increase innovation and the adoption. One of the issues that uh, I've been arguing strongly that I think is getting in the, way, in the way of things is for Canada to adopt the world's strongest intellectual property system. We have a number of issues with respect to our intellectual property system. Um, first of all, there's no right to appeal for the innovative companies. So if a generic company gets a product approved by Health Canada, the fact that it may infringe on somebody's intellectual property uh, does not come into play and someone you have to sue through the courts. That's In other countries, there is a right to appeal. Uh, issues around patent term restoration. It's taking longer and longer to bring products to market. Ten, what used to take two years in the 50s, uh, 10 to 15 years in the 90s is taking even longer. So by the time the product's on the market, there's very little patent protection left. Again, in other jurisdictions, Europe and other places, they have patent term restoration where they'll extend the patent. Uh, data protection, where Canada finally moved to give the uh, innovative companies eight years of protection over their own data. Uh, we went, we took some time to do that. Well, Europe is 11. Barack Obama, President Obama's proposed 12 in his health care reform. 
And we're a small country, and if we want to attract innovation, if we want to attract private sector innovation, if we want to appeal to that, we've got to create a playing field that incents people to do it in Canada as opposed to Canada, the European Union, and other, ones, other areas. Um, reimbursement rate for innovative medicines. Saw some data that says, and I think this is going to be the thin edge of the wedge for the public, 50% of new medicines are publicly reimbursed in Canada versus 80 to 90% in countries like Germany, France, the U.S., Finland and other countries. And when the public realize they're not getting access to medicines that they would otherwise, I think there's going to be another consumer demand hue and cry that we're going to have to deal with. And finally, government is first adopters of healthcare innovation. The concept of st strategic procurement, where the government who wants innovation, wants us to move forward, actually thinks about that when they're purchasing products and services. The government at the federal and provincial level is a large spender on, on health care services and why not appreciate the fact that there's research and development being done here, manufacturing, uh, take that into consideration when looking at first adoption. I've talked to a lot of owners of medical device companies and others where the hardest market for them to break into is their home market. They have to go to, to export markets first. And if you look at our example, that billion dollar product, we were successful first in Canada, then we went around the world. But by the way, when we come back to Canada now, it's still treated as a commodity and we have the same issues around value for innovation, R&D and manufacturing uh, that we would as a startup company or starting with the first, first uh, product. So I think there's some opportunities there. Uh, just thought, table some thoughts and look forward to uh, some questions and discussion further on. Thanks.